welcome to Transformative Principle, where I help you stop putting out fires and start leading. I am your host, Jethro Jones. You can follow me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. I'm launching a new website, transformativeprinciple.com. You can go there to learn about and join the mastermind. And also, you can go there to learn how to get positive press for your school. What's better than you telling your story all the time? Getting other credible third parties to tell your story for you. Go to transformativeprinciple.com. Once again, that's transformativeprinciple.com. Welcome to Transformative Principle. I am excited to have Liz Wiseman back on the show. She is a researcher and executive advisor who teaches leadership to executives around the world. She is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Multipliers, How the Best Leaders Make Everyone Smarter, The Multiplier Effect, Tapping the Genius Inside Our Schools, and the Wall Street Journal bestseller, Rookie Smarts, Why Learning Beats Knowing in the New Game of Work. And that was the book I interviewed her about on the Transformative Leadership Summit a few years ago. And most recently, the Wall Street Journal Best Times, Wall Street Journal bestseller, How Impact Players, How to Take the Lead, Play Bigger, and Multiply Your Impact. She's the CEO of the Wiseman Group, a leadership research and development firm headquartered in Silicon Valley, California. Some of her recent clients include Apple, AT&T, Disney, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Nike, Salesforce, Tesla, and Twitter. Liz has been listed on the Thinkers 50 ranking and in 2019 was recognized as the top leadership thinker in the world. Liz, thanks for coming on the Transformative Principle. Oh, well, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, I'm excited to talk to you today. Excited about your book, Impact Players. It's such a good book and something that I think was missing because we all know when we see an impact player, but we don't always recognize how valuable they are. So can you first tell us about what an impact player is? Well, an impact player, first of all, it's, it's, it's a metaphor that I borrowed from the sports world. And, you know, just like a team has impact players, the world of work has impact players. And, you know, they are these kind of standout contributors who bring value everywhere they go. And, you know, in the sports world, the metaphor, you know, they're people who bring extraordinary value themselves, but they also make teams better. Teams are stronger, more optimistic, play better when they've got these impact players on their team. Yeah. And I want to talk a little bit about the, the value that they bring, because in the business world, it's easy to think about that in terms of money that they can make you X percent more than what you'd be making otherwise. But in an education system, we don't really think in those terms of making us more money. We think about impact and about impacting kids' lives and making the school better and those kinds of things. How do you interpret and understand the value that someone who really is an impact player brings to your school? Well, the way we did this was we asked managers, the leaders, and they identified in our research, we had managers identify three different types of people that they had worked with in the past. <clears throat> My favorite part of the research is that all of the people in each of these three categories were all people who were smart, who were capable, and who were hardworking. So this wasn't a comparison of like highly capable and maybe not as capable kind of individuals. Everyone's smart, capable, hardworking, but we asked them to identify someone who was doing the job well versus someone who is making an enormous difference, having a huge impact and influence. So there's these high impact contributors, typical contributors. And then we also asked them to identify someone who was, in my terms, under contributing. And that was someone who was really smart and capable, should have been a great hire, but they were playing below their potential. And when we Ask managers to um, tell us about how each of these three types, how they thought, what they did. We also ask them to assess the value of the contribution made by each individual. And we found that the impact players were bringing value that was three and a half times greater than a typical contributor. 
And I think the thing I want to point out there is it was not three and a half greater than someone who was not doing a good job. It was three and a half times greater than someone who was doing their job well and, you know, following direction and taking ownership and focusing and carrying their weight on team. So it was like three and a half times better than someone who was already doing a great job and almost 10 times greater than someone who was under contributing. So again, everyone's smart and capable, but you know, it's an extraordinary, it's not like 10 or 20% better. It's three X and 10 X more valuable of a contribution. Yeah. And so measuring that value of the contribution, what are some takeaways about how to understand that it's 10 times better? Because it seems like a fuzzy number kind of thing. Like how can you really put the value on something like that? And if I can give an example uh, real quick to maybe help clarify the question I'm trying to ask is um, I had a librarian, Tana Martin, who was just amazing. And without her, any of the great things that I would have done in the school probably wouldn't have happened because she was solid. She was 100% there. She went above and beyond, but not in a way that she sacrificed her humanity or put everything into the school. So I was actually getting 20 hours a day out of her instead of eight. But just because of how she understood people, how she connected, how she inspired people, she made it possible for us to do the right work that we were doing. So how do you figure out whether or not that person is is making that kind of an impact? Well, I think there's a couple things we saw when we talked to managers. One was that their work was just so much better. Another is that they were doing the right kind of work. Um, the other way is there was sort of a multiplier effect, which was not only were they doing great work, it's that they set a certain standard that everyone else in the team then um, adopted or it affected. So it was not only was about their work, it's about how they raised the level of contribution for everyone on the team. And then there's this like deputy kind of effect, which is not only do they do work that's like on target and high quality <clears throat> and positively affect others, it's that the, the manager then in some ways deputizes this person. Uh, you know, they become kind of the right hand, like, oh, I can't get to all the meetings. I'm going to have them, you know, step in in my stead. I can't talk to all of the like upset parents. Like I can turn the most valuable or the most difficult assignments over to them. And they, in some ways, allow leaders to replicate themselves and be in more places. Uh, and people just know, like if I hand it over to this person, it's going to get done. It's going to get done well. It's going to get done right. It's going to be done in the right ways. And they help um, establish culture for the organization. Yeah, you, you brought up the word trust. And I think that that is so important in so many areas. But especially as you're doing work that matters, having people you trust and know that they can do that work is incredibly valuable. The, the other thing I wanted to spend the majority of our time talking about is how do we hire for impact players, because this is it. Once you know that they exist and you've been able to identify them in the past, that's all you ever want to work with. You don't ever want to have other people. Um, but of course, you can't have everybody on your team always be an impact player. And sometimes there will be ebbs and flows. So actually, let's take that second example first. Are there times where people are are impact players and then they go out of it? Or once you're an impact player, do you stay that way your whole career? Well, I, you know, I think of it more as a mindset that people move in and out of. Now, there are some people who spend most of their days working in this kind of mindset. They're kind of, I don't know, the universal impact player that wherever they go, they end up operating this way. And, you know, some of the people that I interviewed for the book, profiled for the book, were people like this, like you could drop them into any environment you know, maybe they come out of the financial industry or healthcare, you could drop them into a school situation and you'd find that they would they would find themselves working this way as well. Now, there are probably a few people who never work this way, like they haven't had that kind of experience and maybe no one's ever rattled their cage or pointed out and saying like, this is, 
this thing you're doing is good. Yeah, there are probably people who either inhabit or never inhabit this way of working. But for most of us, it's a mindset that we move in and out of. And most people can say, yeah, I, I there was a time in my career where I was absolutely working this way. And we find that it tends to rise above leadership or environment or culture. That it wasn't like, oh, yeah, well, I was working at my best. I was sort of like on fire with what I was doing because of my boss. But we find that there are people who just, even if they've got kind of a pretty cruddy boss, and I've spent, you know, the last 15 years studying, you know, best, the best bosses, these multiplier kind of leaders, as well as diminishers. And I understand the effect they have on people. But there are some people who seem to rise above that. But it's, it's for most of us, it's a mindset. We come in and out of it. And so it's about like regaining this mindset or figuring out this is what it looks like when I'm doing work of extreme value and influence and impact. And Jethro, I, I would say that you can have an entire team that's thinking and working this way. I, I don't know that that's not possible. John Cat Educational supports high-quality teaching and learning by providing publications that are research-based, practical, and focused on the key topics proven essential in today's and tomorrow's schools. The latest John Cat publications include a book whose bold, transformative ideas amaze and infuriate people around the world, according to one reviewer, a title from Global Leaders in Curriculum Planning, Practice, and Retrieval, one book that says stop talking and start doing with regard to teacher well-being, and much more. These books, used by educators of all roles across North America and worldwide, amplify fresh, engaging voices with practical strategies to create transformative change. Learn more in our show notes at jethrojones.com slash podcast. So is being an impact player something that you can coach people into? And if so, how do you do that? Yeah, I think there's a lot of parts of it that are very coachable, but there are parts that you can't coach. Um, uh, who, who is the, who's the, uh, was it Bill Campbell who was famous for saying, you know, you can't coach height, uh, that there are some things that you just can't give people that they don't already have, but most of this is quite coachable. The part of the research that I think I enjoyed the most was like that part that we did after we were done. So we did all of the research, figured out kind of what's common and characteristic of the impact players, what are the mindsets, the beliefs, and the behaviors. And then I started to ask, I don't think all of that is really coachable. Some of these things seem more more innate than others. And they're probably heavily to do with how um, how our wiring got set. And I don't know if it's a nature or nurture question, but, you know, it's like might have gotten set before we got into the workplace. And so we took all of these mindsets, behaviors. And uh, first of all, I looked in the psychological, the, the psychology literature to figure out what does the psychology literature say about like an internal locus of control? Is it something that you can change about yourself? And there was not a lot written out there, not a lot researched on this. So we went instead to executive coaches. And I'm part of a group called the MG100, the Marshall Goldsmith 100. So it's kind of this group of some of the top executive coaches around the world. And I asked them, in your experience, helping people develop these mindsets, these beliefs, or these practices, the behaviors, which of these have you seen people successfully learn and adopt and which have been really hard to change. And we've got, there's this chart in the book. I've got it, I've got it like flagged here on my book. And what I did was take the all these mindsets and behaviors and organize them from the least coachable to the most coachable. And I think the implications of it are pretty simple, which is if you are a hiring manager or if you're assembling a team, what you want to do is hire for the least coachable, the most innate or so it seems, and then spend your time coaching on the more coachable things like 
seeking feedback is a behavior that is pretty coachable. You can kind of teach people how to do that, how to offer help, how to influence others, how to be able to like take perspective, how to stay accountable for things tend to be coachable. Things that aren't particularly coachable, someone's orientation, like, or belief that they can both lead and follow. Um, It's one of the things we saw that they do with kind of equal ease. They're willing to step up and lead, but they're also willing to follow others. They have sort of a, a healthy disdain for authority and formality and hierarchy in systems. They don't feel like you have to be knighted in order to go out and kind of take the lead on something. And that's a harder thing to coach. Probably comes from our cultural upbringing. You know, how much deference we give to authority figures. Um, Hard things to coach. Internal locus of control. This sense of informality. um, This ability to look at ambiguous situations and see opportunity where others might see threat, which is um, what I got to write about you about in your approach to being your principal. Like that is harder to teach people how to do. So you want to hire for those things. Yeah. Well, thank you also for writing about me in my school. And I just want to share a little bit about that because um, our school, when I was interviewing had been recommended by the school board to be closed and you say that that's a thing that's hard to coach for, but I find it interesting because I feel like we should always look at opportunities and things that are presented to us as opportunities, no matter what they are, even if they're threats. So I said, look, we have this old school that everyone wants to shut down. That is a great opportunity for us to do whatever we want. We don't have to worry about like everybody thinks we're already on the way out. So what's that's a great opportunity. Let's take advantage of it. And we're able to to go, but up in this scenario, that's right. We're about to be closed and now nobody cares what we do. So let's show them what we can really do. And it was interesting because I didn't understand as the principal there, why people were resistant to anything because we were about to be shut down anyway. And so it just didn't make any sense to me. And it's in hindsight. Now I can see where they just didn't have that same, that same mindset as I did. And again, I don't think that that's anything special about me per se, except that I just have that. And I, I'm excited about those kinds of threats that really are opportunities because they mean something. So I appreciate you, uh, you highlighting that story because we did do some amazing things that people on this podcast have heard all about as they happened. And it really was amazing to be part of that opportunity. I know. I love that story. And I love that like illustration of looking at that uncertainty and finding the opportunity. And I don't know that it's not, it's not possible to help people see opportunity. I think the part that's hard to change is someone's knee jerk reaction to ambiguity and threat. Like, Oh, I see like a situation where I don't know if we're going to continue as a school. Like that seems dangerous. That seems dangerous to me. I don't have control. I don't like it. And I think people's initial reaction to that is what is a little bit harder um, to coach. I like to look at that same situation and say, well, what I would coach is not trying to change people's initial reaction to it. You know, some people are like, this is great. This is like nowhere to go, but up. Whoa. But not all of us have that as our first reaction, but what we can coach people to do is to help people stay long enough to have a second reaction, which is like, okay, that feels bad. That feels disconcerting. Let's just stick with this a little bit longer and see if we can find an opportunity somewhere in there. Yeah. So these less cultural things also seem like they are more, difficult to identify? What are some strategies for hiring specifically? What kinds of things should we have in place to know whether or not these people have the less coachable skills and attributes that we want them to have when we bring them on? Mm. Well, I think if there's a fundamental that I would look for in the hiring process is I would look at people's comfort level with situations out of their control. And do they tend to lean into those 
or do they tend to lean out of those situations? Uh, there's an example I put in the book, a, uh, a dear colleague, friend of mine, he's like my favorite test pilot. If I come up with crazy ideas. He's always willing to like, yeah, I'll try that out. And I asked him to try out some of these hiring strategies I suggested. And he said, you know, I tried them and I wasn't sure that I instantly knew how to find the impact players, but boy, it helped me see the people who weren't. And one of the things he watched is he watched people's body language. So when he asked them to describe a situation where they didn't have a lot of control. You know, some people are like, oh, yeah, like, oh, you know, cracking their neck, kind of like, oh, and other people are like, oh, yeah, it was a total mess. And like, and that, but they're excited about it. They're excited about the, like the possibilities that sat inside there. And he said, I just watched for their behavior. Literally, are they leaning into that discussion? Or are they kind of like, I'm going to try to keep distance from it. Um, the other techniques that, that you can use. So that's generally what I would look for, but you can also use behavioral based interviewing in here, the way that I can lay it out. Some of the mindsets and behaviors lend themselves pretty well to behavioral based interviewing, which is typically done with um, like a star, a situation, a task, an action, a result. So you're saying, okay, what's the situation? What did you have to, you know, do what did you do and what happened you can do what i'm calling a soar an s-o-a-r what was the situation what was your outlook toward that situation and then what action did you take and and what was the result so you know if you want to know how people handle messy problems that don't sit nicely into any one person's job it's one of the five situations that differentiate impact players from from everyone else then you could ask someone to describe a situation. And then you can ask them, okay, what was their outlook? How did they think about that? You know, what was their orientation? And then, you know, what did you do and what happened? And I think those kinds of hiring techniques can help us. Yeah. Well, and what I appreciate about that advice is that it's about more than asking about the technical aspects of the job, which especially in education, can you teach is a technical thing, but should you should know that pretty quickly after learning about them and possibly watching them teach those kinds of things you can you can see pretty easily and i believe those kinds of things can certainly be coached but it's those other those other skills that they need to have about when you're teaching a class and one of the kids turns out the lights and uh, your whole class was already on the edge of eruption and then the lights go out and everybody just loses it, how you handle those types of situations are much more telling about the kind of teacher you are than, you know, whether or not you can teach multiplication effectively to, to get the desired results on a test. Um, so one last question I'd like to ask is, what is one thing that a principal should do this week to be a transformative leader like you? Well, I, I think there's something that all great leaders do, and it would be this ability to see what problems and opportunities look like through other people's perspective. And, you know, so practice some, some healthy perspective taking. Okay, in this situation, you know, what is the teacher's perspective on this? What are the students' perspective? What is the superintendent's perspective on this? What are the parents' perspective? It's getting out of our own head. You know, it's the common, and I say this because what I found common in the very best leaders, leaders who have this multiplier-like effect on people they lead, as well as impact players, is they don't spend their time in their heads, stuck in their own thoughts. They're operating outside of themselves, looking at What's important to the people around me, to the stakeholders around me, and how do I make it important to me? And it really starts with being able to see problems and opportunities through the perspective of the people we lead, the people we serve. Yeah, I, I think that is great advice. And getting stuck in your head is so detrimental to your success. And, and it's so easy to get stuck there also. And you think that your problems are everybody else's problems. And um, just as an as a side note here, when when so I, I coach principals in a mastermind setting and we talk about what's going on and nearly every single time somebody brings up a problem, somebody else will say either out loud or to themselves, 
wow, I'm glad that's not my problem right now. <laughs> and they think their problems are so big and then they hear somebody else's and they're like, oh, yeah, that's really good. So getting out of your own head, getting perspective, I think is great advice. Um, again, the book is called Impact Players. You can get it wherever you're going to find books. And if you uh, want to connect with Liz, thewisemangroup.com is her website. And she's at Liz Wiseman on Twitter. Liz, thanks so much for being part of Transformative Principle today. Jethro, thanks for inviting me. And thank you for allowing me to feature you and Tanana School in the book. Thank in chapter you. one. Yeah. I love this one. Thank you. Everybody go get the book just to read about me also. I mean, that's <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Liz.